Well, good evening. My name is Eric Barker. I'm Dean of the Purdue College of Pharmacy, and it's a pleasure to welcome you this evening to yet what is now becoming a, a, a sort of a tradition around here, but we're beginning to wrap up. This is one of the final Ideas Festival events as we are wrapping up the 150 years of Giant Leap celebration here at Purdue University. Tonight, we have, a pleasure, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Goping Fang to campus. Dr. Fang is the Poitras Professor of Neuroscience in the McGovern Institute for Brain Research at the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is also an institute member of the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard, and the Director of Model Systems and Neurobiology at the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research at the Broad Institute. Dr. Fang studied medicine in Hangzhou, China, and then completed his PhD training at the State University of New York at Buffalo, and postdoctoral training at Washington University in St. Louis. Prior to joining the faculty at MIT, he was a faculty member in the Department of Neurobiology at the Duke University School of Medicine. Dr. Fang's research is devoted to understanding the mechanisms regulating the development and function of synapses in the brain and how synaptic dysfunction may contribute to psychiatric disorders. Using genetically engineered animal models, Dr. Fang's laboratory con combines cutting edge technologies and multidisciplinary approaches to unravel the neurobiological mechanisms of neurodevelopmental and psychiatric disorders. Dr. Fang will be making a brief presentation, and then I will join him on stage for a brief conversation and dialogue, and then we will wrap up the hour by inviting you, our audience, to provide some questions. His Ideas Festival question and theme of his presentation is, what if breakthrough technologies could make us smarter? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Goping Fang to Purdue. Thank you, Dr. Park, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, it's a great honor to be part of the uh, 150 uh, celebration for the wonderful history of Purdue University. And I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I toured the campus and had a wonderful time meeting with uh, many um, e extremely uh, talented students and, uh, and the faculty members. So, uh, so the day so far is great. As long as I don't, I don't screw up this last part, it will be a wonderful visit. So I'm, I'm trying to do my best. So today I want to, um, instead of presenting my own work, uh, I want to discuss with you uh, some of the new technology that has been um, uh, developed and uh, how this new technology may affect our daily life and for both us and uh, maybe for benefiting uh, of a lot of patients. So uh, you probably know, just um, I'm focusing on how can we change our in, uh, you know, um, cognitive ability, which is our intelligence, and you probably know um, intelligence just like every other um, human trait, uh, whether it's behavior or actions, it's a bell curve, right? So most of us in the middle, but there are a few of extremely talented ones like you, and on the, the one side, and then many of, our, many of us always wish one as smart as Einstein, right? But they are also on the other side of the curve, which, uh, you know, um, some of them um, are just have a um, you know, normal function, but other than them at extremely uh, um, other side of the curve, maybe uh, need help that they can have a normal life just like we have. So how do we, um, so how do we uh, potentially can move this bell curve all squeezed to this side? Right? That's, you know, where, uh, if they say, if, if there's a way can you improve yourself or your kids uh, of their in intelligence, will you do it? Now there's a possibility we can do that. So, and then the question is who should do it, who, who should decide, and who should pay for it? All these are questions that I'm, I want to discuss with you briefly and tell you the technology why we think we can do this now. So what determines, so, so IQ actually is very closely linked to success, right? This has, there are a lot of studies. This is just a table I borrowed you know, from Kaufman and show that the, the, uh, you know, what kind of professional you do is highly linked to whether it's child, uh, ch what, linked to your, not only your child, uh, your adult IQ, but also linked to your, uh, uh, the IQ when you were a child. So, so this is, you know, depend on what kind of IQ almost determine what kind of uh, successful career you can do. So the question is what determines IQ? What determines our intelligence? So how do you decide that? So probably the best evidence is come from study twins, right? You have twins, and identical twins, which you have almost identical genetic material, 
that is identical genetic, not even almost, it's identical genetic DNA material, then you can be raised in the same family or can be adopted into different family or even different continent, right? So then you can study, do, does their IQ same or different, right? So this can determine, is the IQ determined by genetic material more or uh, uh, environmental uh, factors more? So this is the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, kind of one of the generalized results, right? So this on the left side, y-axis, you can see similarity of, of, of intelligence scores, the IQ, their correlations, and these are the raising conditions. They, all of them are from identical twins. What you can see is that if identical twins are reared together they're in the same family, you see they are very, very similar IQs, they're almost 90% identical, right? So it's correlation. But if they are separated into different families or different continents or different countries, you can see that they are actually also very close, but not as close as the identical twins, but it's still uh, around uh, above 70%. That means the majority of intelligence are determined actually by genetic material, and environment do play some uh, role, but uh, much smaller than the, uh, than the genetic material. So you can see uh, whether they are identical twins or, or non-identical twins and the siblings and unrelated. So you can see that uh, there's a direct correlation between the genetic uh, uh, um, factors and, the in, uh, and IQ, the intelligence. So then, so then comes, uh, so uh, how do ge genetics uh, determine the intelligence, right? So, so, so based on twin studies, so heritability is around 60 to 80%. That means the genetic play a significant role, but it's not all of them. Because they play a significant role, then there's a ch chance that if you change the genetic material, you can improve or um, uh, 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 impair the intelligence, right? So, so in disease conditions such as neurodevelopment disorder, I'm going to talk about a little bit, is that you change the genetic, you have genetic mutations now lead to uh, intellectual disability. But there's also ch a chance that you could change the genetic uh, material and make human much more intelligent. So, and, but how genetics determine the intelligence? So luckily or unluckily, in general, it's not determined by one gene. So, so uh, how do you study that? You basically, we call it GWAS, genome-wide association studies. You can study hundreds of thousands of uh, people with high IQ, IQ compared with hundreds of thousands of people with lower IQ to see what the differences come out. So this is called GWAS studies. That, uh, what it, what uh, it shows is almost like many other common traits, right, like height. Height is not determined. Height is very heritable, right? If your parents are tall, the chances you are tall is very, very high. But they are not determined by one gene. It's determined by multiple genes. We call it polygenic. So they are GWAS studies for, uh, for uh, IQs. Uh, at least one of the studies show, show there are over 500 genes actually involved or related or correlated with, with your IQ. So that means that your intelligence is mostly genetically determined, but not uh, determined by a single gene, which is probably a good thing, right? So then each gene only play a very small role. So that have a ch make a challenge for how do we change the genetic material, make humans smarter, right? So however, on the other hand, single gene mutations can cause very severe intellectual disability, right? We have so many, many of them, uh, uh, neurodevelopment disorders uh, with very low IQ, right? Today, uh, one of them, uh, I use the example, our uh, average IQ is only 40. So they can never live independently. So we need to find a way to correct this problem so these people can live independently and uh, uh, have a normal life. So, and the, because of the new technology, now we could potentially develop, because it's a single gene, right? We can correct this gene uh, mutations and actually, dramatically improve or even cure this intellectual disability and really change people's life. So, and uh, so because of this genetic engineering, it could be basically part of daily life now, if, whether it's treated patient or include, uh, improved intelligence. So what is the new technology? So the new technology you probably heard, at least some of you have already heard, it's called CRISPR technology. Basically, it's the new type of genome editing technology. The idea is that this is basically a system used by bacteria to destroy viral DNA, right? 
bacteria, uh, you know, bacteria phage, which is a virus to kill the uh, bacteria. And whenever they inject the DNA into the bacteria, bacteria will uh, take some of the DNA, integrate it into their chromosome. So next time, if it survives, next time you come, I know, I'm going to destroy you. So these are the uh, uh, systems that uh, you, we can now have been developed to use to, uh, to manipulate the mammalian genes. So the idea is that you have uh, uh, this, uh, this, so this is called CRISPR-Cas9. The Cas9 is a nucleus. It can cut the DNA. So because the uh, virus DNA coming and uh, incorporated into the uh, bacterial DNA, bacteria actually remember it. So next time, if the uh, virus uh, comes again, the virus will, uh, the bacteria will release a piece of DNA, uh, the RNA, uh, uh, used as a guide RNA, guided the, the uh, basically the Cas9, the nucleus, to the viral DNA and cut it. So, so that will destroy the virus, right? So now scientists, uh, many of them, um, I listed here, um, uh, you know, uh, um, Champagner lab, Feinzang's lab at uh, MIT, and the Donner's lab at Berkeley, George Church lab at Harvard, they actually uh, changed the system. Now we can use to manipulate almost any cell type, in any species almost. So the idea is you use the system, you design whatever you want. It's, it's a guide RNA, so I, as long as match the gene, it will bind it to the DNA, then you can cut the DNA. So now we have gen uh, genome, all the genome sequences, so we can specifically design a guide RNA and bind to whatever gene you want to cut, uh, you want to manipulate, it will cut the DNA. Now that gene is cut, your cell will try to fix it, right? So that's how we get UV irradiated, we get, we, you go to a beach, your DNA is probably damaged in some cells, but you don't get a cancer because your, your, cell, your cells always try to repair it, and most of the time, repair perfectly. So, however, occasionally they make mistakes. Once they make mistakes, you will have cancer or you will have other problems or cell may die. So in this case, basically you will have a mutation. That's how you can ge generate genetic mutation now in any species. On the other hand, if you say, okay, I want to change this gene because I know if I put this, change this amino acid, will make, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, will correct the mutation for humans. And then you can put a template we call it precise, uh, precise integration. You can replace the piece of DNA with whatever you provide. So they, this made it possible to do anything, right? You can generate mutation, you can repair mutation. So if you, we know there's a patient have a, a, a single gene mutation, let's say uh, rat syndrome. Rat syndrome affecting, affecting many, many of the girls, and they, uh, they, uh, they were born normal, then after two years later, they started deteriorating, right? Many of them will die at a, a very young age. So we, we know these are, are single gene mutation called MECP2. We now can potentially go in, correct the mutation, they will be probably live normal life. So, so this you can do both, make genetic models or you can repair human mutations. So this technology is unbelievably powerful and efficient. So it can be basically, it's a, uh, can do multiple purposes now. I'm not going to go a lot of details, but you can, I mentioned you can do make mutations or you can repair mutations, what we call the knockings. But the most important thing, it, it's highly efficient. It can use almost any species. You can use animals, plants, hum, even humans, right? So, and you, so many of them may have multiple, let's say intelligence is determined by 500 genes, but Maybe there are five genes are very important, and if you change it, you can slightly move the bell curve, right? So this system can multiplex. We can do five genes at the same time. So this is now it's possible. So this has been now in the, it's only less than four years, uh, 20, so it's less than six years old actually, but it has been widely used, right? So uh, some of the uh, clinical trials are being started to try to correct some of mutations. And now, so give you a, a, a couple examples. One example is, you know, we can now genetic engineering pick as a organ, donor, uh, organ donors, right? So we, you know, there are a lot of patients waiting for a long time for kidney uh, transplant, right? So now the idea is that you can actually modify the, uh, the um, you know, DNA in the pig that will have a match and will get rid of all the, you know, uh, uh, viral, uh, retroviral uh, fragment in the pig DNA, which is detrimental to humans, and you correct it, then you basically can, uh, every time you need, you can harvest the kidney from pig and the transplant to the patient, right? So my joke is, we can do any of these things. So in the future, when you're getting old, 
your organ can be replaced one by one by a pig. You walk like everything in your body is a pig, except your head is still human, right? So, but they are functional, right? No one can tell. And uh, so, the other, uh, so the other really important uh, implication, which is uh, even more direct and more impactful, is for, uh, for gene therapy, right? So um, there are many, many severe neurodevelopment disorders. You pro many of them you probably know, and you probably encountered, or you have relatives related. These are patients who have very severe neurodevelopment disorder. They are very low IQ, right? So they cannot live independently. And these are a very big problem for not only for the patient, but also for the family. So uh, one of my main research goals is to try to find ways to help this patient uh, because they, are, they are really need help to, to, uh, to be living independently. Now, these are many, many of examples, including rat syndrome I mentioned, fragile X, uh, mental retardation, Phelan McDermott syndrome, uh, which is also very severe. Their average IQ is only 40. So I'm going to use Phelan McDermott syndrome tonight to show what can we do to potentially in the future help this patient. And uh, so their general feature is all these have very severe intellectual disability. Then they have many other problems, including autism spectrum disorders, seizure, sleep uh, problems. And for these severe ones, actually, genetic mutation play a key role. Actually, now uh, we already know uh, so at least 25% of them are caused by mutation in a single gene. And for single gene, we now can model them, and we now can potentially go correct them right, with this new technology or with um, a similar technology. So, and so because of single gene, we call it monogenic uh, mutation, these are ideal for gene therapy. So in the next 5, 10 years, you will see a lot of new gene therapy approaches to try to really cure this uh, disease. I want to mention is. Although these are monogenic, which means a single gene mutation, their pathology is yet generally not a single gene because each gene can affect many other genes. So it's almost impossible to fi find a drug that can correct all different pathways, all different processes that it disrupts. So gene therapy probably is the only way to really cure them. The other uh, approaches, circuit manipulations or pathway interference, these probably can correct part of the uh, pathology, but not all of them. So I want to use Phelan McDermott syndrome uh, as an example. This is a, a mutation in a gene called Shank3. Shank3 is critical for build neuron-neuron interactions we call synapse, right? A neuron is very different, brain uh, is very different from the rest of bodies. We have 80 billion neurons in the brain. We have trillions of the synapses, they connect each other. Neurons do not function uh, uh, autonomously. They have to interact with other uh, neurons to make a circuit. So everything you do, Every thought you have, there's a multi, millions and millions of neurons involved to form a computational uh, process, then and end up have a results and have output. So even lift my hand is a very complex neural circuits problem. And uh, so these have very low IQ, and they, they really uh, uh, very intellectually dis disabled, so you need a lot of help. And so we want to see how can we uh, study them, how can we help them in the long run. So, and so these patients have uh, repetitive behaviors because they are autism spectrum disorder. They have social interaction problems. They have sensory problems. Like sensory overload is one of the major issues of autism spectrum disorder. So we made a mouse model to start with. You can see they're repetitive grooming themselves, right? And they also have social uh, interaction problems. So if uh, I can have this uh, video played. So you can see these are, on the left side is uh, two white type mice, on the right side two mutant mice. For white type mice, uh, their social is whenever the two uh, uh, mice together, they basically sniff other mice, uh, mouse behind. That's their social interaction. It's very different from humans, but it's a social behavior. For mutant you will see, they even bump into each other, they will completely ignore, right? So now they stay very far away. You see white type, they are you know, social with each other. They, they cuddling together, right? So, I'm not sure this is related to human, but at least it's a very interesting biological phenomenon. What causes this? Why a single gene mutation can cause mice behavior so differently, right? So uh, then there's another phenomenon we think is also very interesting. So these are uh, two, not the white type is in the, in the right, on the right, and the mutants on the left. We just, in their home cage, we put a plastic ball in the middle, right? See what happens. This is a new thing they never saw it before, and it, so you can see, Y type is very uh, uh, interesting. We'll explore pre pretty soon. They will uh, go on top of it. 
And mutantly, you can see when their head is getting close, they startle back. So that means their whisk touched it. They're very sensitive. They're, they're afraid of this thing. Right? They never will play with it. Right? So this reminds us that this is called sensory overload. It's an oversensitivity. Right? A lot of neurodevelopment disorder patients, including autism spectrum patients, they are very sensitive to light, noise, all these things. That, so that's why they like, one of the reasons they like stay uh, on the side and uh, alone. Right. So this is a good model probably to study why, what is the, now our study show they actually have a um, um, hyperactivity in their sensory cortex actually. Whenever they receive information, their neurons are hyperactive. So, so now we can find a way to try to, you see the Y type is on top of it, they are never getting even close to them. So these models help us to understand how, how these genetic mutations generate this kind of, uh, that kind of behavior. So, so then the, the question is, all those behaviors you can see in adults, um, these are all neurodevelopment disorders. If we develop a gene therapy or treatment, can we actually reverse it later on, right? The reason we call it neurodevelopment disorder is because it's a development defect. So a lot of things when you develop afterwards, you cannot reverse, right? We call it a critical window, right? So I have a, a accent because I didn't grow up here. My, I, I came 29 years old, so I already way past my critical period, so my English is not uh, as good as anyone or my son who you, you cannot tell if you don't see him, he, has a, he, he was my son, right? So, so this is, a, so the question is, how do you tell? Can you, how can we test what age we can treat a patient in the future still effective? So we designed a genetic ways to test in mice first. So basically, we let the mouse grow like mutant. Then in any age, we can give a drug to restore the gene function, right? Just like gene therapy, similarly, and see, what can you reverse, what you cannot, can, can, you cannot reverse? So, so we did that. What we found is in adult, when you, these mice are four months old, which is completely adult, and then you, revert, you, you re express the gene. Can you reverse anything? Surprisingly, uh, in some of the brain regions, you can. So the top figure is the electrophysiology, look at the synaptic function, they are restored. The bottom is the structural function. Not only functionally you can restore, but structurally, you can make new connections. That is very exciting, right? So you can make new connections. That means if whatever defect you have in this brain area, this is striatum, which is more very important for motor and repetitive behavior, all these things, and you can restore them. Now, the, do they restore the behavior? Yes. So you can see this is, a, I saw they have repetitive compulsive grooming that skin off, but after you turn it on, the hair grow back. The, the only difference is the hair grow back is the white. This has something to do with the drug we induce for, for the, uh, for the uh, gene expression. Um, but they also restore the, uh, the social behavior. So, so, so um, and in the middle is the knockout, this is the white type. You put the mice, let them choose whether they want to interact with the mice or interact with the object. You can see white type like interact with the mice is the heat map and mutant like the object. But once you restore the gene expression in adult, they, they now go back to like uh, interact with other mice. So that means that some aspect can be restored even in adult. They give us a hope. However, that's not the whole story. There are actually things you cannot reverse. So a lot of things you cannot reverse. For example, their motor defect. This is what we call the open field. You just let the mouse run around to measure their activity. You can see that the Y type on the top line, mutant and the restored, no difference. So, so, so there are things you cannot. What you cannot? Anxiety you cannot, the motor defect you cannot. Also these you know, uh, sensory defect, we call it novel object phobia, you cannot restore. So there are many things you cannot restore them in adult. So now, if, what if I turn the gene on earlier, right? Before they become adult. This is turned on after three weeks of birth, and you can see many things that we cannot restore before, now you can restore them. So this tells us that if the mice are humans, which they are not, we can conclude right now that at least in mice, neuronal connection and function in the adult brain have certain plasticity. In certain part of brain, they are plastic. Even you have developmental defect, we can still restore them in mice, right? But there are also critical developer windows that we people have studied for decades that we know their language, there are many uh, visual, you know, uh, uh, critical window. These critical development windows are key. That many of them, once you pass the critical window, we cannot restore anymore. That means we really have to treat as early as possible if we want a full restoration of function in neurodevelopment. It's the same thing. If we want to improve intelligence, 
we may also want to deal with much earlier, right? Because what is the intelligence? What is the cognition? Cognition basically is your computation power in your brain, right? So they depend on the connections, right? So if you wire something wrong, unless you correct that wiring in your computer, your computer is not going to work very well, right? So it's the same kind of thing. But your connection made during development, refined after birth usually. So that's critical period, you still have plasticity. After you pass that, you don't have that plasticity. So that's why the only certain part of the brain is plastic. The one I showed you is plastic is a striatum. Striatum is for habit formation, motor activity. Even at my age, I can still pick up a bad habit. That's why this is very plastic. But uh, there are a lot of things. People say, oh, older people are very stubborn. Yes, our cortex is fixed. We cannot change our views anymore. Uh, much harder to change our views anymore. So there are different brain regions have different uh, plasticity. So the good news, if, my, if mice are humans, there is a postnatal window. That means we don't have to deal with embryonically because we cannot even diagnose them. That means after birth, we still have a window that are called a critical window. We can still diagnose them, figure out a way to treat them, and correct them. So this is the hope that this might be uh, effective. Now, this is all our mice, right? I was specifically written here if mice are like humans. Unfortunately, they are not, right? So the reason is we have done all these things in mice and worked really well, right? However, none of them have been translated into humans. There are many clinical trials failed, almost all of them, for uh, CNS disorders. So, for example, the, one of the most famous things is Fragile X, rental retardation. Three companies all failed the clinical trial. They published wonderful papers in neurons, in, in, in uh, all different journals, right? And uh, Pfizer uh, also worked really well in Huntington disease and also failed the clinical trial. The most recently, just next to our building in Cambridge, Biogen, right? So this worked really well in mice for Alzheimer's disease, failed. That fa failure overnight cost uh, Biogen $18 billion. Their stock dropped 18 billion, they still haven't recovered. So the joke right now is in the field is, it's a great time to be a mouse because we can cure anything you have, so it's almost everything, right? So, but our goal is not to understand a mouse. Actually, we use a mouse as a model, try to help a human. Uh, so what do we do? So that, that leads us to think we need you know, additional models. Mice is always going to be a wonderful model. It's genetic manipulation, they are mammals, so there are a lot of things are conserved. But we now realize there are a lot of things are not conserved uh, either. So one of the biggest problem, probably, by the way, um, it's not a mouse's fault, right? So, so, so it's, it's always scientists how we use the model properly. Every model is useful. Whether it's C. elegans, Drosophila, they're all useful to help us understanding the human biology, right? Cell dust was discovering C. elegans. Well, it's all conserved in humans. So every model, but for understanding cognitive function, higher brain function, maybe we need additional models, not to replace other models, but for further to understand them. So one of the biggest problem actually is the prefrontal cortex. During the evolution, the most expanded area of the brain is the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is the main re reason we make decisions, we make cognitive calculations, right? So if you look at this, this is humans, macaque monkeys, marmoset monkeys, you can see their prefrontal cortex is much, much bigger than the uh, rodents. This is the rat, actually. And many of the gray areas, these are critical areas, are evolved in the monkeys and the humans, but they barely exist in rodents. So that probably make a very big, big difference because it's not only affect this brain region, but since they're all circuits, cortical, subcortical circuits, so it affects the whole brain function. So this is probably one of the reasons why so many things work so well in mice, actually they do not work in, in, uh, in humans. So, um, so the idea is then can we use better models? Our, mo our models, we should not say better because we, have not, we don't have a proof they are better. But can we use the model which is more close evolution to humans? Right, so, so the CRISPR technology now allows us to do this. So we now can put human mutations into um, uh, monkeys to see whether they um, you know, model better of the, uh, some of the higher function uh, defect in, uh, uh, in humans. So, so 
right now in, in the uh, in the world in the uh, uh, world all over the country uh, uh, world, including uh, in uh, uh, Japan, China, and in the U.S., two major monkey models have been uh, used. One is the marmoset. Marmoset is very small. It's about 350 grams, with almost like a rat, and they are very fluffy, so they look bigger. And the other is a, a macaque monkey. So marmoset is a new water monkey, so it's a little further than the humans. A macaque is an old water monkey, so it's closer to humans. Their brain structure are uh, much closer to humans. But each has an advantage and disadvantage, right? So macaque monkeys live for 30 to 35 years. If you want to study uh, later onset diseases like Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, you don't want to be a graduate student to work on it. You'll be a long, long time before you, so you, you probably will quit. So mom said it's much shorter, so there's a good chance you, you, someone will make a model, you can probably study them. So we, um, with many others, uh, we try to uh, understand whether this model can help us to understand autism spectrum disorder, like social cognition, social behavior. And uh, so we actually worked with a large group of scientists in China. They had, so far, all the macaque monkey uh, uh, knockout uh, uh, genetic mutation papers are published from China and the marmoset are from Japan. These are two leading countries in this. So we work with them together to generate a shang mutation. I told you shang leads lead to a severe intellectual disability. And uh, so we were lucky we had a homozygous monkeys and a heterozygous monkeys. In humans, they are all heterozygous. So, and we found that in these monkeys, they, uh, you can give them activity watch. Right? Just like we carry, we, we say, oh, how many hours did I sleep last night? Right? So you can do the same thing. You give them two weeks, then take them off to see, retrieve the data to see. You can see why type of the blue. They have day and the night activity are very obvious. Right? Day, they have very active, night they have very little activity. So they sleep really well. But in the mutant, you see heterozygous in the middle, you see day activity reduced because patients also have redu reduced the motor activity. They have motor problems. But night activity is dramatically increased. Right? So this is a very mimic human condition. If we have tested drugs, so now we are testing, we identify target, we test the drug. If we can improve this sleeping problem, right, it may have better chance to translate into humans. So that's kind of a, 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 a use we think we can, uh, we, uh, it can help us to understand and develop drugs. Then the most interesting is cognitive, uh, uh, social activity. Right? Social, I showed you mice social, is sniff other mouse behind. That's not a, a normal social, human social, right? So, but if you see this monkey, so these are two monkeys. Um, in, uh, there's a, for each monkey, we have a Y type called a probe monkey. They never saw each other before. Then for the test monkey, either it's a Y type or mutant. The probe monkey is, have a green color on it, so you can tell which. We use the same monkey to probe every uh, mutant or control monkey. Right. So you put them together, they're divided in the middle. They cannot see each other. For five minutes, let them get used to the smell and everything. Then a scientist will come, you know, uh, take the, the uh, divide off, then the monkey can see each other. You will see how they interact. Could I have the video play, please? So you can see this is a Y type with Y type, right? So you can see this person coming, it will, uh, you know, um, uh, take the divide off. Now suddenly the monkey can see each other, right? So and what you will see is they immediately get engaged, but they never saw each other before, so they are cautious. So they see the green color, that's the probe monkey. The other is our control monkey for testing. You can see they are engaged, they follow each other, they are very engaged, and they're back and forth, right? So they will look at each other, and so if one goes to the other side, it will go, and one, it will back off. So you can, they are very engaged, they look at each other. That's a normal social behavior for monkey, right? Almost like, you know, us, if you're not gonna suck, hug someone you never see, uh, uh, never met that one before, uh, you usually you shake hand, you talk, and then you become friends. So that's what they're doing. So next video is identical. Same green monkey, right, the, the color monkey, but uh, the, uh, the other monkey is the uh, mutant, with a heterozygous mutation of shang which you found in human patient. What you will fi find is, could I have the uh, video play, please? So see, repetitive behavior, repetitive flipping. That's a very common repetitive behavior uh, in monkeys, but humans use different repetitive, but you can see a repetitive behavior. Then you will see, oh, uh, you know, this person will release the barrier, then they can get it, uh, see each other, right? So you can see this is the probe monkey come, this monkey goes the other side, this is the mutant monkey. The monkey is interesting in something, but it never looked at the other monkey. It's just a look at the outside, look at something, right? Even getting very close to each other, it doesn't look. It just goes somewhere else. 
So the actually, after a while, this wild type probe monkey get frustrated, actually completely ignored, because it seems this monkey, see this monkey is always interested in something, but never really interested in other monkey. We think this kind of social behavior, we can understand what is the brain circuit defect, see, when come, when go. So they never engage each other, right? This monkey is not interested. This monkey, we know it engage, we test with 10 different monkeys. So, so you can tell that there's a very significant difference between the social behavior. And this social behavior is much closer to what we think is the human social behavior compared to the mouse sniff other mouse behind. So if we, in this, if we can correct this problem, maybe there is a ch better chance that this can be translated into humans. So we can, this, this can really help us. So, and then because their structure is so similar to humans, so we can actually do functional MRI to see are there biomarkers, their activity changing in the brain. We actually found a very significant difference between wild type and mutant monkeys. So this could potentially, these are non-invasive, right? For humans, we do the same thing. So this can be translated into humans to see whether human patients also have this kind of defect in, the, in their neural circuits, in different brain regions, including thalamus, striatum, sensory cortex, visual cortex. If they do, then this can use a biomarker did our treatment improve this basic function of the brain? So um, that now, uh, that this is, these are macaque monkeys. Now uh, with the, the help, we now have a large colony at abroad and MIT. So the marmoset work we do all at MIT. Now we have shank three marmoset now. We just generally did mimic a human mutation. We only have one monkey, so we have to wait for the second generation before we can study it. And these could be help us doing genes, test gene therapy, test drug uh, treatment. And like you, you are very close to Eli Lilly. They, you know, I heard they are going to shut down the. Uh, neuroscience program, uh, research program, actually, uh, uh, I just heard of it today. And it's, the reason is not, there's no market, they are not interested. The, the reason is, they did so many years and worked so well in mice, none of them worked in clinic, so they, they cannot afford to keep doing these fa fa uh, failed things. So we're hoping these kind of things maybe will generate a new interest uh, investment into, because we have a lot of, lot of neurodevelopment patients, Alzheimer's disease patients, Parkinson's patients. We need help. So we hope this kind of study will help us to uh, improve the uh, 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 de development of the treatment. So, and these monkeys, we, we have automated behavior tracking. And uh, these are much faster than, so uh, computerized machine learning program. So we work with a lot of AI people at MIT to develop this system to, to uh, uh, automatic tra tracking. So we don't have to ask, um, MIT undergraduates can watch hours and hundreds of hours of videos to score for us. So um, the computer can do this kind of work now. So um, now we're mostly te testing their gene therapy approaches and drug uh, development for these models. And uh, so now the question is, if we can use it in monkeys, can we use it in humans? Yes. People already showed that the, the CRISPR technology, not only can you can mute, make a mutation, correct a mutation in monkey, you can actually correct mutation in humans. This was done by Oregon uh, 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 Primate Center. They actually use uh, Health Science University and Primate Center. They actually use human embryos. You can correct human mutations. So if you can correct the human mutations, then we can also change the human genes in normal people, make it better, right? So the question is, you know, what can you change? We actually know if someone want to be athletes, you want a bigger muscle, you, there are genes to do that. Should we do that? So all these are become society questions and ethical questions. So I want everyone to think about this. It's not science fiction. It's real. Actually, you, you, we need everyone to be involved to think about it. What should be done? What should not be done? Right? So and the, there are many questions involved. There were several meetings discussed this. The technology, we still have problems because they have off-target effect. But this could be fixed in the next few years. What if we fix everything? It's perfect the technology. Now what are we going to do, right? So they are targeted, and then who needs it? For genetic disease, actually there are very, very, very rare cases you need it. Why? Because we have perfect IVF technology now. You can always test the embryo, and before implantation, select the right one implant. They are set, Tens of thousands of babies born normal. Why do we need to modify the gene? There are only very, very rare conditions that if both parents are dominant, uh, are, 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 are uh, homozygous, dominant, or recessive, then it's become a problem. 
right? But these are really, really, really rare. In that case, you need to correct them. All other cases, you can always use the IVF to select the right embryo and the implant, there's no problem at all. So then the question is, can we use it to enhance human traits? There are many, many traits we want to enhance, right? So you want your kids to play football, you want to be more athletic, you want to be kids go to Harvard, you want to be more you know, high IQ, have a little bit of competitive edge. You actually don't have to change a lot, a lot of uh, you know, uh, um, significant magnitude of IQ. Small change can give you a competitive edge, right? But the question is, who has, who has the right to determine? Because once you change the genomic DNA, it will pass along to the next generation forever, right? And the major problem is we actually don't know if you change a gene, what else will change, right? It could be a lot of things become worse, one thing become better, so how will we determine this? Without testing a human, you may never know. So, but if let's say everything's perfect, we can increase the intelligence, who should decide? Who can afford to it? If it's really expensive, who can afford it? Then you have you know, this inequality problems, right? The, the rich is getting better, then what are you gonna do? You, you cannot compete with them anymore. So all these are society questions we should start to think about now, right? So these are um, not a science fiction, these are totally possible to do, and uh, it, it's actually not going to be in the far future. It will be in the near future, at least for gene therapy to help patient, to help intellectual disability patient, I see it within 10 years. And maybe five years will be in clinical trial, in 10 years maybe there are a few of them will be developed in clinical use. So, um, one of the best example is um, Alzheimer's disease. Now we know there are, own, there are many, many factors that can contribute to Alzheimer's disease, but one of the biggest risk factors is Apple E. If you Apple E4, you actually, sorry, I've just given my, whoa. So, um, so I, I'm, I may stop in a, a, a minute. So Apple E4, if you're homozygous, you have very high, uh, high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. If you have Apple E2, you have very low risk. It's protective. Should we all go change the human race into Apple E2, homozygous? We can do that, right? Then we come very, very uh, much delay the happening of um, uh, Alzheimer's disease. There is a large study in Netherlands that show 1,700 uh, people over 100 years old, very clear mind, can do anything, and only one of them has Apple E4. All of them, all the rest doesn't have it. That tells you how strong this effect. Now we can change them. There are people actually doing that in the lab to test can we, because it's not a gene, it's actually, you know, small fragment change between Apple E2 and Apple E4. So these are real questions we, are in, we will encounter very soon in the society, determine what should or what should not be done. And I want everyone to you know, think about this, and you should really get involved in the future. So and MIT did a survey, MIT Technology Review did a survey. Uh, a few years ago, um, majority of us think in the US think that uh, you know, if you want to change the baby just for enhanced Intelligence is probably going too far. But a, a slightly majority think that reduce the risk of serious disease is okay. So, and you can have your own, own opinions. I think society debate uh, it should, be, uh, you know, should be starting right now and should not be determined by a few people, a few, even a few scientists. So I'm gonna start here. I can acknowledge all many, many people involved in the, uh, in the, in the lab. The Monkey Walk actually is a large collaboration, and I'm particularly grateful to all the people, especially our donors, to support our research. Thank you. Oh, hi. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, lots to talk about. I suspect for many of the folks in the audience, the opportunity to see for the first time genetically modified monkeys was new. Uh, for some, it's a bit scary. Uh, and so, to your point, when science fiction talks about genetically engineering the superhuman race, uh, 
what we're talking about is within a short period of time, we'll be able to do these things. And so from your perspective, what are some of the first things that we as a culture, as a society, really as a world society, need to think about it in terms of putting guardrails around the uses of these technologies? So that's a really good question. It's a tough question. Probably everyone has a different opinion. In my own opinion, is I think that um, it's really important to develop this technology for uh, treating severe uh, disorders. And I meet a lot of parents. They bring sometimes bring their baby two years old, three years old to my office, just try to say, okay, whatever you do, please help my baby. My baby is, has rat syndrome. It's, deteriorating, right? They, are, you know, they have seizures all the day, and they cry all the time. I think these are the patients that we really can do. But there's also dangers to uh, modulate, uh, you know, modify our genetic material, right? You are not talking about uh, drugs. You are talking about the forever change the human DNA. And in one hand, it's kind of directed evolution, right? It's, 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 you, you make the mutation, uh, you make it better. But better is, we think it's better. We actually don't know it will be better because every gene has multiple functions. We, none of the genes so far, we completely understand its function, right? So it's very dangerous to go on to say, oh, changing the gene will enhance the ability. Yeah, will enhance the ability we know, but it will probably cause a lot of other problems we don't know. So in my view, um, many of us think it should be at least temporarily banned on any human embryo uh, 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 manipulation until we really have a society debate because it should not be determined by a, a few people. It should be the society should have the right to decide what is the best way to move forward. Technology still can be developed, but not applying to humans. That's my view. And many of these had already, scientists already voiced a similar view, and I, I totally agree with them. So one of the things that you point out in, in the survey in the, the MIT article was while making babies smarter was certainly controversial, the use of technology for therapeutic treatment, though, on the other hand, was a little more accepted. And so right. as we think about neurodevelopmental or neuropsychiatric disorders, many of them are the result of a small battery of changes in, in, in a battery of, of genes. And it's difficult to study those disorders and understand the complicated genetic changes that occur in those disorders. How do you think CRISPR and maybe some of the other emerging technologies can help us tackle those very uh, challenging? Disorders? Yeah, so this is a very, very good question. So as I mentioned, there's only, even in the neurodevelopment disorders, there's only 25% are identify, they are identifiable genetic mutations. Many of them, majority of them so far, is considered polygenic. That each variant, there are actually not a mutations or considered a mutation. Each variant only contributes very little. Maybe a hundred of them together. So that's why the parents are generally normal, but if you bad luck, all their mutations, we all have mutations, right? So pass on to the single kids, then that kid is in bad luck that uh, disrupt uh, to a certain degree that you have a neurodevelopment disorder. So there are multiple ways right now to study them. Uh, actually, what the people have done is using uh, IPS, cell, uh, IPS cell technology. Because you take the skin cell from patient, they have the perfect combination for, uh, you know, for the disease. You culture them. Then you can use G, uh, you know, CRISPR technology to, re you know, uh, uh, to repair or mimic the, some of the conditions to see which one play a key role. So I don't believe. Even there are hundreds of mutations, I don't believe each one contributed similarly. Mm -hmm. So they are probably you know, major contributors and minor contributors, but you just need them all together to make a very severe case. So um, there are now technologies can do multiplexing. So let's say when, with this IPS cell derived neuron, we found you know, 50 genes are changed, um, can expression changed. Can we, just regulate 10 of them, and will they Im improve? The answer is probably yes, because the whole concept of the polygenic is you need everything together. If you take 10% away, maybe they are just much improved. They're 
because they don't lack, they don't have the everything to make it, the patient clinically uh, uh, significant. So it, it is possible you don't have to collect everything, but you have to collect a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. And the CRISPR technology is completely capable doing multiplex, even for hundreds. People have done hundreds of them at the same time to regulate the gene expression or correct the mutation. So that is a feasibility in the future. Of course, the more you put to change, the more off-target you will have. So that problem we have not solved. So I'm not recommending using humans at all at the moment. I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So if you have a question out there, we do have microphones on the sides of the stage, and I'll invite you up in just a moment. But I'm going to ask, how much more potential do you think the human brain has left to be explored? You know, there is a probably an urban myth out there that we use just 10% of our brains, but do you think that we are indeed underutilizing our brains? And if so, do you envision any technology to help us unleash our brain power? Okay, that's a really tough question. <laughs> <laughs> so my view is um, for most of us, um, we are not using old brain power. Because I, I, what I think is, if you think about the difference between our capability, whether it's athletics or brains, right? So if you ask me play football, I could be crushed by anybody, right? <laughs> so, so I'm, what are you, uh, a thousand times worse than the athletes? It's the same thing for brain power. So I think the best comparison is whatever on the planet we have found that the incredible, incredible capability. But it's not, uh, the, it's more on individual uh, tasks actually not on the whole brain. So whole brain power, maybe because the combination, maybe we are, I, I don't know, maybe, I, I'm not saying we only use 10%. Maybe we use the, you know, uh, more than 10%. But for individual tasks, they are very, very smart peop people. They are very, very capable, you know, extreme people have extreme memories, right? So it's individual tasks. I think we can explore many, many, many folds because you, these people exist on the planet. So I think it's the best to comparison is compared to regular people like, uh, you know, my memory is maybe below <laughs> not, uh, uh, average, but with the extreme memory, and you can tell the difference. I think the difference is huge. Mm. So we do have a lot of power to explore. How do we explore you know, these kind of ability, use them? And I don't think neuroscientists know yet. And so there are many, many you know, myths all out there, but I really don't think I can provide any advice. I don't want to screw up your exam next. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to open up the uh, floor for questions from our audience. And so if you would, please make your way to one of the microphones to ask Dr. Fang a, a question or two. Hello. Hi. So I do mouse behavior. I'm a um, grad student in my third year. And I'm just wondering, with all the translation crisis going on with big pharma, how is that going to change the landscape of academic research institutions? Are we going to start ditching the mouse model and moving to non-human primates? Is that the only way to be competitive nowadays? Uh, that's a really good question. I don't think that's the only way to be competitive. I think we should never focus on one model. I have said. And I always say, um, we actually have no proof. Uh, we have no success yet in monkey model, right? So it's still very explorative. Uh, it's only because evolutionarily they are closer to humans, so we have a better hope. So I, I would say we have failed many times in mice. We have not failed yet in monkeys. So we, maybe it's also failure. Maybe the own human is the only model we have. To, then it, it, it will be a problem. So there are people, there are many different ways. IPCS cell is one way, but they don't have perfect circuits. And transplant human cells into uh, you know, a mouse brain, monkey brain is another way. Then people are really start to think, how do we develop drugs without animal model? Right? If animal model 99% fail, why do I test them? So before you test the animal model, you want to ask, if this mouse model fails, do I stop this project or do I move on? If you still move on, why do you want to test them? So there are a lot of debate. And so I think all need to be uh, used. And I don't think a monkey is the only way. And I'm not even sure monkey is the best way. Human is probably the only perfect model. Even humans are not perfect. One human is not perfect model for another human. So we have a lot of problems in this. But um, don't be discouraged by 
big farmer's decision. Big farmer has moved out, has continued to move out, Eli Lilly announced today. They are cutting their neuroscience research in England, right? That's the only major research they have now in neuroscience. But a lot of venture in the last few years, um, ventures and biotech start. So the bigger farmers are decide, I'm going to put a cash in my bank account. Whenever you figure out something, I'm buying you. You said you're not going to sell, not true. It's just I didn't have not offered you enough money. If I offer you enough, you will sell your thing to me. So that's their mentality. Actually, there are many, many ventures starting companies. If you are in, uh, around MIT, there are many, many ventures looking for opportunities to invest in neuroscience. So it's not that bad, actually. It's actually getting really good. So I encourage all of you, uh, actually, if you have a good idea, start something. Talk to the venture. Actually, I'm, one of the impressions today I got is people are very, very uh, uh, um, active in, uh, in uh, actually, uh, translational research here. So it's really... Um, Really fun to see, actually. Very much like MIT culture. Yeah. Another question? Hello, I'm Marshall. I'm a second year pharmacy student. Um, I work with Dr. Yang. And my question is, um, if we alter genes, which would alter, say, the, the structure of transmembrane proteins or cell surface proteins, um, could that lead to a potentially serious autoimmune response since we are born with self-identifying ant antibodies, um, could changing those surface proteins, could that cause like an autoimmune response similar to like an organ transplant? And if so, how frequently, how serious do you think that that might be? Yeah, so that's a, also a really good question. So um, the two parts of them, if we change them during embryos, germline in humans, it's probably not a problem. Right? It's immune tolerance. You can tolerate its own, it can set its own protein. However, if we change it later on, and it could be a problem. So, so up postnatally, right, the, the, if the patient never sees this protein, then it will become a problem. You, you, you could introduce, although it's, your, it's a human gene, you introduce a new gene to this person. Luckily, most of them are heterozygous. They already have the protein. You just increase them. So in most of cases, OK. The major problem is CRISPR is a bacterial protein. You introduce, you will generate immune reaction. How do you deal with that? That's a problem we have not solved. So it is possible that if you long-term, so people have tried to use short-term delivery protein. Once you fix the gene, protein will be degraded, you're totally fine. But this has not been really successful in the brain yet, but people are working on delivery systems. So. I think we have another question over here. Hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, so in your uh, talk, you mentioned that there are certain areas that can be fixed. Um, so the critical thinking and executive thinking, can is it the part that can be fixed, or is it the part that cannot be fixed? So right now, in mice, that's the part we cannot fix in adult. But you probably can fix if you put the gene back much earlier, postnatally, but before they are mature. So. In, in the prefrontal cortex circuits, we believe in adult, it's quite fixed and it doesn't have the plasticity we want to, and we couldn't fix it in adult mice. But if you give them earlier, the gene, restore the gene function earlier, like you know, three weeks old or, or two weeks old, you can actually fix them. Okay, thank you. But I was reading somewhere that you know, adults, even older people, are fully capable of learning a new language. If so, then how come they are able to learn in old age? So, uh, yeah, so really good question. So that's what I'm saying in some part of the brain, right? So uh, learning language, and, uh, uh, but they are never going to learn as good as the, as the uh, uh, young people. So um, for a lot of circuits involved learning skills, um, stridum, they are very plastic, actually, in mice and in humans. That's why if you... If older people can pick up bad habits or get addicted, these are all involve the cortical striatal circuits. So they have certain very significant amount of plasticity in adults. That has been done in mice and has been probably shown in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, humans. For example, visual system, um, binocular vision, right? Binocular vision in, peop in people in poor country, they have cataracts. Um, if you remove them before 10 years old, they perfectly have binocular vision because the, uh, you all know, if you study vision, the axon has to cross, they have to segregate, right? 
So, but that's the, the critical period. But if in adult, you take out the cataracts, they can see perfectly, but they will never have binocular vision. So the plasticity is gone. So in cortex, the plasticity really are limited. But in the subcortical area, they are very much um, active. So. so you're saying in, if, if somebody is uh, like a, it, what is considered an adult brain? Is 18, 19 uh, an adult In humans, um, recent studies suggest maybe after 25, you are much less plastic, so we have a long time too. So you are all plastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, one of the the uh, goals of our Ideas Festival here at Purdue for the past year has really been to uh, provide our campus community the opportunity to go deep into some areas around science and technology, how it interfaces with society and culture. And I think you have certainly done that this evening with your presentation, Dr. Fang. Thank you for coming Thank to you. Purdue. Let's join me, join me in thanking Dr. Fang one more time. Thank you. Me. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. We have a